up sound speed. Sound rolling. Ready, Kirk? Okay. Roll picture. The Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History has over 144 million objects, like this narwhal tusk. My name is Kirk Johnson, and I'm in charge of all of them. 99% of the collections are behind the scenes, and these are the people that work with them. This is Carla Dove from the Division of Birds. Here in the Division of Birds, we have somewhere around 620,000 museum specimens. And that represents about 85% of the diversity of birds in the world. You look at these specimens and you realize that this is where the science is really going to start. We're using our collections to identify birds that collide with airplanes and help us improve aviation safety. Dr. Bob Robbins, curator of butterflies and moths. I have been professionally employed as a lepidopterist who works on butterflies for about 35 years. This is the essence of my being, is to know everything about butterflies. There's a whole world out there that, unless you look very closely, you don't see. And it's an interesting world, it's a fascinating world, and it is full of practical value for human beings. This is Ellen Strong, curator of mollusks. What I love about this collection is its breadth. We estimate that we may have as many as 20 million specimens. We are preserving a record of past life on this planet, of present life on this planet, and preserving that for the future. I take that responsibility very seriously in, in providing access and caring for the specimens for posterity. Dr. Jeff Post, curator of the National Gem and Mineral Collection. Minerals in this collection go from something that formed maybe in the last few tens of years to others that formed more than three billion years ago. We know right now there are more than 5,000 minerals that make up the Earth. And in our collection, we probably have more than half of those. Each one's a little piece of the puzzle. And you try to put all these things together and hopefully eventually understand the big picture of how the Earth works. And Floyd Shockley, collection manager for entomology. We have just a little over 35 million specimens in the collection. A third of all insect life on Earth is represented by at least one specimen in our collection. When you look at a collection the size of ours, you're starting to get to a point where you can ask really big questions. The questions related to global climate change, habitat destruction, and you can only answer those big questions if you have a lot of specimens collected over a long period of time from a lot of different species. To understand the Earth and the living things on the Earth, you need to collect those things and preserve them and study them. And that helps you when you need food, or when you have a disease. All that stuff arcs back to the fact that we have samples of the whole planet here, and that's how we understand the planet. If you have money that's been damaged in a fire, in a flood, that's been eaten by insects or animals, we'll evaluate and determine how much is there and reimburse you for it. My name is Eric Walsh. I'm the assistant manager of the Mule Currency Division. Every year, the Mule Currency Division receives about 23,000 cases. People will send money that's been somehow damaged and we reimburse annually about $40 million. It's a free service the government provides that we pay dollar in, dollar out. We require 51% of the note present to pay on it, and that just protects us from paying twice on the same note. Once we determine the amount, we will send a treasury check for what we discover. We're pretty low tech here, so the tools of the trade are scissors, knives, uh, scalpels, glue and tape, and maybe a pair of tweezers. The most challenging cases are usually cases that the money has gotten wet and sat for long periods of time, and it will actually petrify and be solid as a brick. A lot of it is the dog ate my money. We get hundreds of those cases a year. A lot of people will hide their money in the oven and forget about it, or they'll get it wet and put it in the microwave, and that will ignite the currency. Our most infamous case took place in the 80s, and what happened was a farmer lost his wallet in the field and discovered that his cow had eaten it and we always encourage the submitter to send in the package as it is, and the farmer sent in the cow's stomach, which we were able to retrieve the wallet from and reimburse the farmer his currency. 
Our office consists of uh, just under 20 people, and we have 12 people that examine and process the submissions, and they do roughly between 1,000 and 2,000 claims each year. We do get an increased amount of cases after a natural disaster. Over the past year, between the uh, hurricanes and wildfires out in California, we've reimbursed over $2 million. We're called upon when a lot of people hit their low point, so any relief that you could provide someone after they lost all their money in a flood or after their house burned down, it's very rewarding. Hopefully we're a service that you'll never need to use, but in case something does happen, we're here for you. I've been threatened by Haiti with voodoo over food. I've taken mangoes from passengers from Jamaica and been threatened with my life. Never a dull moment here at JFK. Make it easier. That's it. The reason why we're confiscating all this stuff is not because it's harmful to the human being. It's harmful for our plants and our animals. This is a big port. Last month we processed 1.5 million passengers. You figure between fruits and vegetables, we're, you're talking about two or 300 kilos a day in just one terminal. So you're talking about four to 600 pounds. What kind of foods are you confiscating? Every day is different. Every season is different. Chinese New Year, Christmas, Easter. We have beef candy from China, serrano ham from Spain. We have lots of avocados, salami from Italy. No, Pedro, I take it back. Salami Supremo. That's Spain. Spain also. What is this? Once the food item is seized, it's put in what we call the contraband bin. We drag a contraband bin across the terminal. It's about a block long. Get a little exercise and begin the process of grinding up all the prohibited food items. We're at the grinder table. The officer will look and see if there's any little exit holes or entry holes, and that's where you're going to find the insect. Do you enjoy that part of the process? Is it kind of a stress reliever for you? Oh, the grinder is great. Sometimes I go home with a little bit of mango juice and passion fruit juice on. It's just having fun. The water's splashing in your face. But this is what we have to do to protect American agriculture. It's part of our job. Money. It's everywhere. But what happens when your bills get old and need to be replaced by new ones? That means old cash needs to be destroyed. A lot of cash. This is not, however, the story of money growing on trees, but of trees growing out of money. Well, more like vegetables. We are here at the Federal Reserve Bank in New Orleans, and this is where we shred millions of dollars. My name is Dean Bortha. I'm the lead business analyst for cash services here at the New Orleans Fed. We are the nation's bank. Our job is to make sure that we have a supply of currency. Also part of that is to ensure that we remove unfit, old, dirty currency from circulation. So here, on average, we shred about $6 million in dirty money every day. This could be for any number of reasons. It could be because the note has rips in it, holes in it, tears in it. It could have tape on it. It could have graffiti written all over it. We don't want that note going back into circulation. If it has any sort of those qualities, will be shredded. What we used to do is take all of these currency shreds and they would just wind up as waste going to a landfill. Now through a lot of work and effort, we finally figured out a way where we can take these shreds and ultimately recycle them. So all that green leaves the Fed and heads to a compost facility, where it turns into something quite useful. What you're looking at right now is $24 million, but the soil that it creates will be priceless. My name is Jonathan Christian. We turn cash into soil. It is uh, definitely one of our secret ingredients. It's little in content, but it's huge in what it provides. Currency that's deemed unfit, it's brought to our facility at Wooden Materials. From there, we go through a simple composting process where we convert that into a healthy soil. Our compost is used primarily by urban farmers in the greater New Orleans area. One of these farmers is Simon Manash. And this is a million dollar farm. We are making fresh local food accessible in New Orleans. 
We've grown veggies, herbs, cucumbers, tomatoes, and peppers. The vegetables we grow here are made out of composted cash. It is very fulfilling to be growing using a material that would otherwise go to waste. One man's trash is another man's treasure. And that's the story of how we grow tomatoes out of cash. <laughs>